Our guest today is the chief executive of the Chicago Public Schools. The Chicago Public Schools serve over 400,000 students in more than 670 schools. It is the nation's third largest school system. Prior to his appointment in Chicago, our guest today was superintendent of schools for the Rochester, New York City School District, a position he held for three years. When I talked with school board president Dave Vitale about today's speaker, he remarked on three things. Number one, our guest today has enormous experience in a big city, having served a 31-year career as an educator and administrator with the New York City Department of, Ed of Education. Number two, our guest today was an agent of change in Rochester, New York. Number three, our guest today was a high school teacher and principal who has an ability to connect with the teachers and principals. He is a commercial pilot and native of Haiti. Our guest is married to Dr. K. Brooks Stafford Brizard and the proud father of two beautiful children. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Public Schools, John Claude Brizard. Good afternoon. Before we actually get this show started, uh, Nashua will be changing slides for me. Um, but I want to make sure I make some um, uh, acknowledgments before I actually get started. So I see all the cameras in the back, so I'm going to try very hard not to create news. Uh, but certainly we'll talk about the work ahead uh, for us in, in the school district. So this is an exciting opportunity, and I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about the work ahead for us as a school district. But first, I'd like to thank uh, Jay Doherty, president of the Chicago, uh, the City Club of Chicago, for this opportunity and for inviting me today, as well as the Board of Governors. I also want to uh, give great thanks to uh, Dave Vitale, our board president. I first met David back in 2006 or seven, I think, um, in looking at the uh, potential of coming to Chicago to head the high school program. I also want to acknowledge uh, Vice President Jesse Ruiz, uh, until recently was chair of the State Board of Education. Jesse, thank you for your support. I also want to um, uh, give special thanks as well to Beth Swanson. I met Beth, I think, back in March or April um, at the Pritzker Foundation. Um, thanks, Beth, for your support and everything you've done for us um, in making sure our work continues to be progressive. I also have uh, members of my uh, senior staff who are here today. Um, I'll introduce them. If you can just stand up and just say hello. Uh, our chief admin officer, Tim Colley. Thank you, Tim. Noemi Donoso, our Chief Education Officer. <laughs> Becky Cowell, our Chief uh, Communications Officer. Becky. <laughs> Oliver Sikat, who starts with us in a couple of weeks, as our Chief Portfolio Officer. Oliver, thank you. Oliver's coming to us from the Noble Street Charter Network, so thank you for taking on the challenge. Uh, Jamika Rose, I think her second day on the job, uh, a chief of family and community engagement. Jamiko, thank you, in the back. Mike Rendina, who's director of intergovernmental affairs. Mike, thank you. Chief of staff, Andrea Sainz. We took Andrea for Marnie Duncan. Uh, Charles Smith, head of special education. Charles. And of course, uh, not one of my senior staff, but certainly part of our senior team, Bob Runcy, from the Board of Education Chief of Staff. So I do have one here. So I want to give you perhaps a data story as to what's been happening in our district, what's happening around the country, um, and the work ahead for us. So this is going to be a bit of a deep dive. Uh, if you take a sip of coffee, you may actually lose um, some of the stuff I'll be saying. So I'm going to move to a 58 slides in about 40 minutes. Um, so um, it's like drinking to a fire hose. So, so hang in there. Um, stay with me. 
So this morning I was at the um, Ogden School. Uh, they had their first day today, um, opening a school officially. I had one parent who came up to me and said, thank you for this. This is why I'm staying in the city. I have an 18-month-old. That's the kind of story we like to hear. Um, talking to our folks um, in the north, south, west side, when you hear parents saying, I want to stay in the city of Chicago uh, because you know, creating schools are great for my kids. So before I get into all the story, let me highlight for you some of the wonderful successes of this amazing city. And we've got some amazing things that have been done here in the past few years. We often say that we stand on the shoulders of giants. One of my favorite places is Walter Payton. And before you say, well, they, they test kids who come into the school. Look at the data and you see that this school actually is growing faster than expected in terms of achievement. So even though when you're looking at uh, peer schools, across the state of Illinois, they are doing better than expected with the kind of kids they have coming in. So amazing story at Peyton. Same kind of story at Jones. When you look at, again, the achievement on ACT as what's expected for the population that they have, they are outpacing similar schools or similar peer schools across the state and even across the council, the great city schools across the country. Same story for, for Chicago Military Academy. When you look at their growth as well, um, they are outpacing what's expected of that kind of school. So wonderful stories. And we have many more like that in the city, elementary and secondary schools that parents actually migrate to. In fact, we often, when we look at our data in the city, uh, we notice that the more overcrowded the school is, the better it tends to be. Because our parents have figured out how to migrate to the schools or choice in um, to the schools. But when you look at the entire city um, as a whole, we are underperforming the rest of the country. So we have great pockets of excellence, great islands of excellence, but as a system, uh, we are not delivering on a promise to our kids that we promised them so long ago. Uh, the 150,000 you see on the slide goes back to a report produced by, by, the, by the Illinois Facilities Fund, IFF, back in the mid to late 90s. It's a bit dated, uh, but nonetheless, when you take a look, even using the low bar of the ISAT, the reading test that we currently give to our kids, 150,000 students require or are in need of better seats, of better quality seats for schools. Only about half of our kids graduate in five years, not four. And coming from New York, it was a four-year requirement for graduation. Here it's five, only about half. Only about 8% of our juniors are college ready. You begin to understand the work we have ahead for us. Average ACT 17, we know 21 is college ready or 20 is college ready. Um, and of course, when you look at the exceeds, excuse me, part of the ISAT, uh, only about 17% of our kids are exceeding standards in, in the ISAT. So this is what we've been telling our public for a very long time, that things are getting better, scores are getting higher. And they have been when you're looking at the meets and exceeds part of, of ISAT. In fact, when uh, Noemi spoke to the media after the release of the scores, I think the headline was, it scores up, joy down. Um, the fact is that when you look at this, there's a story behind this. The achievement gap is increasing in our city. Uh, when you look at Latino, uh, African-American versus white students, or affluent versus non-affluent. When you look at special needs versus non-special needs kids, the gap is actually increasing, not closing. So this tells a story where many of our principals and teachers believe uh, as hard as they're working, they were doing better. But we've been telling them differently, that we have much more work to do. Let me show you why. The folks at the council of the great city schools in this organization represents about 70 of the largest districts in America. Uh, took our 2010 scores and took the common core standards. You may have seen the release today, uh, beginning to roll out these new standards across the city. The common core standards are much more college ready, internationally based, uh, benchmark kinds of standards. When we do that, take a look. Our proficien proficiency drops from 65 to 19 percent. When you look at college ready standards, uh, versus the common core. But what's more disturbing, when you look at the Big cities in America, similar districts across the country, we are lagging the nation when it comes to the Common Core. Not to say anything about um, Illinois, we're lagging the rest of, of cities like Philadelphia, Baltimore, um, um, Charlotte, Mecklenburg, etc., or New York City. This is the ISAT. This is where we actually are in terms of college readiness. When you move to mathematics, you see a similar story. In every category, we are lagging similar cities across the country. Uh, and of course, when you look at top, you see what we've been telling our kids and our parents that your, your scores are getting better. But the fact is, you see Chicago is actually lagging major cities uh, in math and, and literacy. 
So let me take you back about 10 years. So NAEP, the National Assessment of Education Progress, is often referred to as the gold standard in assessment. It is a national exam that we give kids um, in cities across America. So in 2003, if you take a look at math eighth grade for African American, we lag the nation in terms of scores for NAEP. If you take a look at Latino students, you see a similar story. We're lagging the nation. This is back in 2002 for reading for fourth grade. So fast forward, the last um, administration of the NAEP um, in Chicago in 2009 for math and reading, take a look. We're doing better than, than Detroit, St. Louis, a few big cities that none of us would like to be benchmarked to, but we are lagging the nation when it comes to the test even nearly a decade later. Um, so much to be done in terms of changing culture um, in our city to get people to have higher expectations. Um, and we know this, of course, because many of our kids go on to colleges and don't succeed, and Cheryl Hyman will be one who tell you that. They're coming in underprepared for what they have to face in post-secondary institutions. So in reading, in math, eighth and fourth grade, we're lagging the country. So the big question, why hasn't it worked? Um, and lots of very, very smart people have done this job. Arnie Duncan is, 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 is brilliant. Uh, Ron Uberman brought a data culture to the district, one you seldom find in, in urban districts across the country. Of course, Paul Vallis, tremendous work done here in the city. Uh, the fact is the world keeps changing and we're not keeping pace with the work. And I'm gonna hopefully show you perhaps why uh, we have not done as well as, as expected. But um, we have to do much more. There are a lot of people who believe that we have different issues. Let me begin to give you some of the statements you hear from a lot of people. Uh, the question is, of course, does our school's inability to teach poor students stem from uh, the school, the system, or society as a whole? Often hear that, right? You'll see a lot of similarities here to what some prominent figures across our country are pushing almost every single day in the press in their writing. The second you hear is that, is it unreasonable to expect a child from Englewood to do as well as some who maybe live in Lincoln Park, right? A lot of questions, and you hear from teachers, from principals, uh, lots of our colleagues are pushing this, these kinds of questions. Another, what about 40 years of reform? Going back to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1972, and as you know, we're about to reauthorize NCLB, this is the proper name for No Child Left Behind, the SEA. Um, and you know we're pushing to a new reauthorization of the law. Um, so 40 years we've been at this. How come we have not gone to scale when it comes to the reforms that we actually desperately need across the system? And of course, the last one. How can you ignore the correlation between a mother's uh, 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 wealth or poverty level and child's achievement? Tremendous correlation between the two. When you look at poverty, when you look at the kinds of conditions that so many of our kids live in. Again, we've done really well for some kids. We've not done well for every kid. Bottom line, and I pushed this to my principals last Friday. You've got so many people who really don't believe that every kid can or every kid will. It's a difficult pill for many of our principals and teachers to swallow. And if you get behind closed doors and talk to them, uh, they will be honest with you and tell you it's not possible. And I told my principals, if you don't believe, you're in the wrong job. First step, you've got to believe every kid can, every kid will, then find a way to actually get there. Abigail Thurston pushes the following. It says, no excuses. In her book, no excuses. Um, and she talks about the fact that poor kids can succeed as well as affluent kids. Let me show you some examples. So Graham Road Elementary in Falls Church, Virginia, look at the demographic. 51% of the kids don't speak English, 81% low income in Virginia, 13% black, 64% Latino. Look at their scores in Virginia compared to the state. They are outperforming the entire state of Virginia. And that's the best way to benchmark your work, right? You take a look at these the, the totality of a state that has the affluence and the poor and see how you benchmark versus that. Take a look, 97, 96% proficiency across the board in a school that's heavily minority and poor. Look at their exceeding versus meets in Virginia. They are outperforming the state. Look, one high school, Elmont Memorial High School in Elmont, New York. Take a look, 
you see mostly African American, not a high poverty school, but a high minority school. These numbers don't even match some of the more affluent suburbs of New York State. Um, these examinations or these, this graduation rate you can see in some cases is 99 percent, 98 percent um, of the student population. When you look at the five exit exams, I know there are six on the, on the screen, the five exit exams are required for graduation in New York State, you take a look and see they are doing really, really well as compared to even more affluent schools across New York State. So it can be done. Let's come locally. Let me give you two examples. Uh, and I didn't pick AUSL schools, I didn't pick charter schools. And I can show you tons of examples of AUSL and charters that are outperforming similar schools right here in the city of Chicago. But these two schools on Western South Side of the city, regular CPS schools, look at their demographic, 94% low income, 95% low income, nearly 100% minority on both ends. Look at their scores as compared to the state of Illinois. Outperforming. We can move the exceeds a little higher, but these schools need to be celebrated. So when I get a principal or an educator who tell me we can't, I said, well, then how do they do it? Same kids. When you take a look at an AUSL school, new principal, new teachers, new adults come in, same kids. The scores are moving double digits every single year. How do they do it? Same story again for the eighth grade, for the same schools I was talking about before. So the question is then what and how? So Tom Paisant, who, who was head of Boston, San Diego, Oklahoma City has a saying, and Tom has been very supportive of my work over the past seven or eight years, tremendous educator, says that it's easier to describe the what than the how, and much more difficult to implement, right? It's about execution. We all know what to do. The question is, are we willing to do the hard work, the granular work of day in, day out, of no excuses, and making sure that we are intervening on a regular basis? So let me get closer if we have educators in the room. Michael Fullen out of uh, Toronto, another sort of international young educator, talks about this work regularly. He says that in education, we tend to focus on standards, professional development, you know, curriculum, assessment, all the stuff that, that teachers and principals talk about. But what he says very simply is that we often forget about um, getting to the granular culture that exists in classrooms or in schools. In other words, we don't execute well. We know what to do. We talk about higher standards. We write phenomenal curriculum, right? Great new assessments. But the practice of teaching does not change in the classroom. We don't get granular enough to change the culture that exists in so many of our districts. So let me show you some of the big theories of action that we have right now moving across the country in terms of reform in urban systems. No one is better than the other. Um, different places require different contexts to what you have to do. The first one is one that is referred to as performance empowerment. This is the prevailing theory behind the charter movement. We're going to give you freedom in exchange for performance. We're not going to micromanage what you do. And of course, this comes from some of the best practices of, 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 of private organizations or, or, or business organizations. Um, David Hornbeck, who uh, preceded Paul Vallis in Philadelphia, um, is the architect of this kind of movement, or we often refer to as PE, performance empowerment. The second one is what we refer to as managed instruction. This is where you see a top-down management where the central office controls everything. And there are some great examples of MI, managed instruction districts across the country. Uh, one of the more famous ones is Aldine, Texas. You've got Garden Grove, Long Beach, California, et cetera. Aldine, by the way, won the Broad Prize for closing the achievement gap faster than anyone else last year. Um, they do a phenomenal job. They actually script what teachers do in the classroom. Every minute of the period, they tell you what to do and what to say. And they say very simply to people who want to work there, this is how we do things. Um, if you don't like it, you don't have to work here. Uh, but that's the, the model and the way of, and they've been doing this for decades and has worked phenomenally well um, in Aldine, Texas. The third, uh, which is what we're going to be pushing here um, in Chicago, is one we refer to as bounded autonomy. It's a combination of the two, of the performance empowerment and managed instruction. Um, and if you take a look and see that key to the su success of this work is the principalship, the, the building leader. And I'm going to talk to you about why I think that is so critical um, to our success. But here, some things remain central, 
some things are given away as freedom to schools. And different districts who are doing this have different demarcation lines. So that the scale moves back and forth depending on the capacity of the system. So curriculum, for instance, for the most part, tends to remain central. Uh, my wife was a cognitive psychologist, will tell you that literacy, if you pick one model for literacy and you're faithful to implementation, will work. But if you've got 10 models in a system that may have as much as a 40% mobility rate, um, you're gonna lose kids and they will not learn how to read. I met a young lady who had been in seven schools in 10 years. When you have that kind of mobility in some parts of the city, you need consistency in curricula. The what of teaching, the how is the pedagogy belongs to the artist, the person who's doing the work every single day in the classroom. But the what is kept very consistent. So time, people, money, tends to be the parts we devolve and allow schools, or local schools, to actually control so they can align their resources to student achievement. The next piece um, comes from the National Center for Education uh, Accountability, I believe now it's called uh, Achievement, NCEA. And what they've done is actually look at high-performing urban districts and low-performing urban districts and compare the two and see what one group is doing that the other perhaps needs to do. Let me walk you through um, the process. And again, this is the kind of work we're going to be pushing um, across the city. One is that high-performing districts, if you can't read this, I'll, I'll um, say it for you. High-performing districts have clear curriculum and academic goals. So we know what we want every child to learn and be able to do by the end of high school. And it's scaffolded from kindergarten or pre-K all the way up to 12th grade. The second is the people piece. Your principals, your teachers, the human capital, the staff selection, the recruitment, and yes, at times the exiting of people who should not be in front of kids or leading schools. The third you know, goes back to the arrangement of instructional materials, the pedagogy, the hows of teaching because it is an art, and we've got to keep talking about how we develop the art um, in people. The third, um, well, Bob DeFour, who writes a lot about education, often says is that how do you know kids are learning? So the assessment, the, the monitoring of the data. So you know what you want kids to know. You have the people to teach it. You teach it, and you assess it. And once you assess how well kids are learning or not learning, the, question, the next question is what are you prepared to do about it? And that's the adjustment piece. So it's teach, assess, adjust. Reteach, reassess, and readjust. So we used to, in education a long time ago, have one big assessment at the end of the year. So we taught all year, and we give one big test in May or June. And then we did an autopsy at the end of that to see what, which kids failed and which ones actually succeeded. Then we pat ourselves on the back and talk about what we have to do next year. And meanwhile, those kids are gone. Then there's a movement now where we have multiple assessments throughout the year to inform the intervention work that we have to do with kids. So you know what is happening in real time. So think of quality management. Uh, think about lean uh, systems, right? Lean Six Sigma, where you are continuously looking at what people need to do to actually make the system better. The best, uh, the newest example uh, is a school of one um, in New York City, and working very hard to bring it here to Chicago where the, the assessment, the intervention is done daily uh, to a, a very sexy algorithm that looks at what is happening throughout the day. And by 4 p.m., the teachers get a new schedule for the next day. And the kids come in the morning, they get a new assignment the next day. So they are adjusting on the fly every single day. Um, and they're using a mathematics program to do that. And so far, the results have been phenomenal uh, in that one school in New York. Again, we're hoping to bring that to Chicago rather soon. So moving from that and to get more granular about our work here, so the mayor's made it very clear um, what he wants to see. So our job is to make sure we execute and implement on, on that vision. And nothing sort of earth shattering, right? It's about making sure that we have the kinds of programs uh, in our schools and make sure every child is college ready when they come out of high school. And we know not every kid's gonna go to college, but every kid needs to be college ready. There is a difference, right? Um, and I often tell people who talk to me about vocational education, and I was a principal of a vocational school, I tell people that today's auto technician is not your grandfather's mechanic. It's a very different world, even in the world of CTE, career tech education. So extended opportunities for students, empowered principals accountable for results, uh, teachers with the resources to thrive, and of course an engaged 
community of parents who know how to access the system. Uh, we need to change what is often referred to as supply parents to demand parents. And for me, a demand parent is one who knows how to walk into the school and get in the principal's face to get things done. And I tell my principals, a parent yelling at you is parent engagement. Um, that is the kind of work you want. You want someone who will come to you and say, I demand this for my child, because that is an engaged parent. From that, we have a pretty robust mission and, and, and vision. The mission, of course, is to make sure every child is post-secondary ready. The vision it has to do with creating a portfolio of high-quality schools, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, and the second, of course, goes back to the people, highly skilled teachers and principals who know how to deliver on, on that promise. We've been very lucky. In a very short amount of time, I've gotten a tremendous amount of support uh, from our community, pro bono support from our community. Bain and Company has been really amazing at helping us unpack the central office to begin to radically change how we deliver services. McKenzie, Parthenon, BCG, uh, the folks at Harvard have been really instrumental in our work. And of course, Deloitte is now working on the top-down IT. Uh, Parthenon just volunteered to do our high school enrollment to look at what we do um, for our neighborhood high schools as well. We know the work starts from looking downtown. One thing I learned really well from Joel Klein in New York um, and Michael Bloomberg is that you gotta start at the top, making sure that you have a lean and agile and flexible uh, central office who understand that they live and exist to serve the needs of teachers and principals. That is the reculturing that we have we've begun downtown. And I tell my folks very quickly, very simply, that the center of gravity uh, at CPS is very, very high. Uh, be careful, you have to move very, very fast, otherwise this becomes your normal in a short amount of time. So keeping people outside and keep keeping to push to make sure that we um, continue to support and change the system is the aim for us. And the second, as you can see, the second big goal in the central office is for people to understand what we mean by bounded autonomy and how we can support principles. So from the work with Bain, we've developed a very lean top-level management, and the yellow will show you there are two new uh, key roles in making this work happen. One is the head of family and community engagement. The other one, of course, is the portfolio office, and I'll explain that um, in, 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 in about a second. So right now, our work is to get to the second layer of the organization to begin to change how we actually work. And very, very quickly, we walked into a system that we found to be very fragmented. We had people who rolled up to managers who reported to no one on cabinet. Silos everywhere, duplication across the system. Unpacking that has been our primary driver over the past few weeks. So from this, we've come to understand that the work falls along four fundamental lines, four big pillars. Best principles and best teachers, and I'm gonna focus on that quite a bit for the rest of the presentation. Best schools, that's the portfolio piece we're talking about. Um, right now, we've been building schools, creating new schools magnet in a way that doesn't always look at the system as a whole or the totality of the district. Uh, the Parthenon Group has embarked with the help of McKenzie. We just finished a facilities review for us to begin to unpack what we have to do to create great schools everywhere in the city. So again, REN10 did an amazing job in terms of the magnet and selective enrollment and a few great schools across the city. We know that for some parents, that even if you build a great school half a mile away, the school in the corner is a school of choice, and that's where they're gonna go. So we gotta make sure those schools really work well. But looking at how we actually bring equity to great schools, military schools, all kinds of schools in programs across the city is the work that we are doing, where we have to bring uh, or infuse talent, where we have to uh, close schools, where we have to open schools. As you see across the system, you get these choice in and choice out. We have one neighborhood where about 70% of the families leave every day to other CPS schools, and 70% from other neighborhoods come into that neighborhood because that's their gold standard. The question then is, what do we want to do in making sure that we address the needs of all families across the city? So the portfolio work that Oliver is about to embark on will look at the combinations of charters, contract schools, CPS schools, all of the above in providing great seats for every family in the city. Uh, one that hasn't been done as well across the country, but one we aim to do really, really well. The third pillar, curriculum, is no small feat, and that's primarily what 
primarily what um, um, Noemi is working on, to change the what of teaching and to change the hows of teaching. The curriculum piece, as we move to the Common Core Standards, is exactly where we're going to bring a new level of consistency across the system. Even when you look at English language learners or special needs kids, very simply, we want people to really understand that the expectation of success is the same for our kids. The only variable is time, how we actually get there. Some kids require one hour, some require one day to learn a particular concept. So time is the variable, and of course, the learning is the constant. The last pillar, certainly not least, is how we better provide access to our community. I was on the radio on Sunday, and the host asked me, talking about Dr. King's legacy, how do we celebrate that, he asked me. I said, look, Dr. King really worked hard for equity. Our job is to help people understand how to access equity. Let me tell you why, I'll give you an example. Um, there's a great story I heard um, um, from a great writer who talked about visiting Memphis and talking to a whole bunch of high school kids who had gotten full scholarships to college. And he asked us, what percentage do you think took opportunity to that scholarship? And we guessed 50, 70 percent, said 17 percent of the kids. So opening the door is not enough. We have to help kids actually enter. And that's part of our work in building the community. So four strategic imperatives. One is to create a transparent way of measuring school quality, and that will apply to everybody, even charter schools and regular public schools in our, in our system. We've not done a good job. Again, if you look at the charter world, um, about one third are great, one third middle of the road, and one third are lousy. We've got to make sure that we hold everyone to the same standard. Um, and for those of you guys who may think I'm anti-charter, I am not. My wife is actually opening a charter school um, in New York. But fundamentally, we want great schools for kids. No one is exempt from these kinds of standards that we will set to make sure every school is of quality. Um, the second one, of course, is the portfolio of diverse community school options. We talked about before, and networks that, that mirror our neighborhoods. So we can begin to bring schools back to communities. And the third, of course, principles as point of leverage. And the last, of course, central office being the place we develop talent to ensure we have the best teachers and principals in our school. This very busy slide shows you how all these pieces interact. And the far left is really where we actually are, are working. We are sitting down and debating and arguing about what we mean by principal autonomy, what we mean by bounded autonomy, how do we support the principalship. So all these pieces, the portfolio office um, here, um, the education piece, the field, the standards, everything supports this unit right here. And on the bottom, the, the back office operations have to exist, have to be transparent to the school leader. We tell principals, if you feel food services, if you feel transportation, it's not working. To make sure the back office supports what needs to happen within, within our schools. Focus a little bit on the principal again. One of the things that we just launched with the help um, of our mayor is the Chicago Leadership Collaborative. Um, the mayor talked about a principal academy. This is it. But it's, it's big in terms of the following. One, as you know, the LSCs, local school councils, are the ones who appoint principals. We control the pool of people who actually are eligible for the principalship. One of the primary pieces that we put in place in this CLC, in the collaborative, is that every new principal will have to go through a one-year residency because we want to accelerate it want to accelerate experience. Um, very simply, when I was an assistant principal for five years and I moved across the hall, I never realized how different that job was. The principalship is key for success, and 75% of our principals come through the ranks, never have gone through any kind of really robust training experience except their Type 75 certification, which may have been as long as 10, 20 years before them becoming a principal. So that kind of residency will accelerate experience. Right now, only 25% of our principals come to a new Leaders for New School, uh, a partnership with TFA, Teach for America, and Harvard, where they go through this one-year residency. But starting next fall, every principal will have this one-year experience. At the same time, too, you want to find ways of nurturing the people who are the top of the game, are the top tier of the profession. One, by rewarding excellence. And yes, you know we don't expect that bonuses or performance pay will improve achievement, but bonuses keep people in the profession, keeps excellent people in the profession. One teacher told me 
that it gives me agency in my profession. I don't want to be paid based on how long I've been there, how many college credits I have. I want to be rewarded for what I do. And this generation of teachers do not like what we have currently as a system. So all of this becomes part of the work that we are pushing in terms of creating a pipeline of excellent, excellent people. So why is the principalship so, so, so pivotal? I'll give you a second to, to take a look at that. So if I may, since I'm a teacher, if I may ask at least one person in the audience or two, tell me what you see on the slide. You can just yell out if you want to. Thank you. It's what happens in the classroom. So if you take a look at this, this is again um, uh, researched. The class adds for reading 60% of the learning for a child. In mathematics, it's 52 to 72% of the learning the classroom teacher is responsible for that. The school adds about 12% in reading and about 10 to 30% in mathematics. The child, him or herself, adds quite a bit of value as well, right? We often forget about the kid in the learning experience. We do to them, but don't involve them in the learning. You may have heard me say um, that you know we are crew, not passengers. It's one of the schools I had in New York that was a blue ribbon school, one of the best top 300 best schools in the country, 80% uh, poverty. And the kids wore t-shirts that say, we are crew, not passengers. And the message was very simple. We take ownership in our own learning. We often forget that, right? But bottom line is that the classroom teacher is critical for success. 25,000 teachers, right? Uh, very hard for someone like me to impact 25,000 people. But 675 principals can we do an amazing job let me show you what else is important. I'm going to show you uh, some different data points from different research groups. Top bottom quartile, 10 percentile point differences in learning between a great teacher and not so great teacher in the classroom. Important. We know it is, right? Let me give you some data about CPS. This is 2003, 2004 to 2007, 2008. Look what we've done about 90% are superior or excellent in our classroom. This is these are tenured teachers, probationary teachers. Fast forward. We got better. We went from less than 1% unsatisfactory to 1% unsatisfactory. There is no quota on what should be in terms of unsatisfactory. But this is what Secretary Duncan um, and others have talked about that we have a problem in our country where 95% of the adults are great and 5% of the kids are reading at proficiency. Major disconnect. We've got to do much more in terms of elevating our human capital for people to understand there's got to be a connection between kids' achievement and how we rate ourselves as being great or not, right? And we've not done a good job as a system in documenting effectiveness or ineffectiveness very, very well. And the principle, again, is key in making that happen. So going back to 2003 to now, not done a great job. Rachel Curtis, um, who writes a book called Teaching Talent, also talks about this. The big difference between the highly effective teacher or principal versus the ones who are ineffective. We know, again, how critical that is. So the message we send to our principal, very simply, is that they, are, they have to be primary human capital managers of their schools. Too often I talk to a principal who complain about an ineffective teacher. And then I ask, well, have you documented? And they go, well, no, we haven't. So what do you expect me to do? Is often my question I push back to them. Um, the same way as a system. What have we done? Do we move ineffective leaders from our schools? We have too many people who cannot do the job who are doing it. So, I would be remiss if I didn't touch on this point as well, so I'm going to. Everyone's expecting it. You know, it's been sort of our trumpet over the past few weeks. Um, yes, time by itself does not solve it, but time enables so much that we need, that we need to do. And this is research to show you. Uh, this is done in Massachusetts to show you schools with extended time how much more positive impact there is on student achievement. Yet, 
this is our, our elementary schools, we lag the country, lag big cities in terms of time available for teachers to teach kids. Secondary, in far to the right is where we fall as a city. Again, time by itself does not, will not do it, but time enables so much, so much of what needs to be done. Now, I'm also one, I've been asked the question over and over again, do you believe teachers should be paid for the extra time? I'm one who really believes that teachers ought to be uh, compensated fairly. It's a hard job, it's a very difficult job. Um, you will never find me complaining about teachers not being paid, but we have not been um, unfair as a city in terms of compensating um, the folks who work so hard in our schools. If you take a look at the graph, we have the highest starting salary of all these cities in America. Only New York beats us in terms of absolute or highest or maximum salary in terms of starting, so we've not been cheap. And let me give you another data point to show you the percentage of our budget that goes to um, um, staff salaries. Uh, New York City, one million kids, nearly a $24 billion budget. Chicago, 400,000 kids, about five billion. And you can see where we start. So we've not been unfair. And very simply, I've been pushing this concept of differentiated pay, which is, which is much like what you have in businesses and most organizations around the world, around the country, around the city, where people are paid based on a number of different factors, right? The kind of license you have, how well you perform on your job, et cetera. That's the kind of push that we are making happen. Um, so we've not been um, exactly unfair in terms of compensation. So the roadmap from now to 2013, you'll see we start very simply and by focusing on different buckets of the work. One is around setting transparent standards. Again, the release today showed that we have a number of schools who will be pioneers in terms of the Common Core implementation and moving down the road to making sure that the four pillars we'll be talking about are implemented over time. In the fall, we'll begin to talk about a blueprint um, for the portfolio work. So over the next three years, we intend to radically change the way we've done business and get very granular in terms of looking at practice within, within the classroom. So the work is hard. Um, the work is critical to the success of our city. We've got tons of exemplars of places that have done an amazing job of making this work for kids. But we all know that none of us can do this by ourselves, which is why we need so much help in terms of the kinds of collaboration we know has to exist for us to be successful as a system. Thank you for indulging me. Ms. Jean, if you have a question, just raise your hand and Ms. Jean will pick it up. And uh, given the speech, uh, we have added 10 minutes to the program. But you won't be compensated, so. <laughs> Not many Chicago public school graduates in this crowd. Okay, here we go. Uh, Kate Mayer, Executive Director, Greater Chicago Food Depository. Will Chicago public schools continue its commitment to breakfast in the classroom? The, the answer is yes, um, and we have. We've made some modifications to uh, the policy. Uh, we listened to a number of our parents who complained about different uh, pieces as well as principals who made suggestions. So the program continues uh, with a little bit of modifications across the system. Uh, this is from no the notorious Bill Hood. Uh, does Chicago public schools have anything comparable to the rubber rooms in New York for incompetent teachers? No. Welcome to Chicago, no. JC. You know, it's, it's actually, it's, it's a great point. I mean, let me tell you how lucky we are as a city. So I come from a state where we have what they call systemic bumping. So a teacher from one end of town could actually walk into a school across town and bump someone out of their job. Happened to me as a teacher. And let me tell you, a lot of young people leave the profession because of that. That doesn't exist here because of the reform laws, I believe of 1985 or 86 here in Illinois. So there is no need for it because of what's been done here with tons of advocacy over the past 20 years. Uh, this comes from uh, Martha Jantro, board member who used to be on the school board. Used to counting votes. Uh, do you know how many high school graduates are actually at grade level when they graduate? Okay, so it's, um, 
it's a difficult question to answer because we don't really look at grade level. So we look at the ACT scores, the explore plan. Uh, what we do know is that if you go back to my earlier numbers, you're on 17 average score on the ACT, uh, 20 is the minimum bar for college readiness. So if you assume that 12th grade reading level is what's required for post-secondary success, I can tell you the vast majority of our kids who are finishing our high schools are not prepared. Stella Black with a long question, breaking the brevity rule, but I'll let it pass this time. Will the tier system being currently used for select enrollment schools be eliminated and revised to let those who truly deserve to be, no sandbagging here, who truly deserve to be in those, uh, those schools based on true ability, not because of their neighborhood they live in? So at times I think there is a bit of a confusion between selective enrollment and the magnet school uh, policy. The magnet has a tiered system. Selective enrollment is more, has, has a tiered as well, but it's more of the uh, testing piece to actually, to actually get in. Um, we had a Blue Ribbon Commission, as many of you know, who went around neighborhoods talking to parents about the past policy and their recommendation was to keep much of it the same. And if you saw in the press last week, uh, the board actually accepted the changes um, well, no changes, I should say, uh, in the policy. So it remains whole for multiple years. But the feedback came from the community. Next question is from uh, Gail Ward, a, 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 for, a retired principal. Uh, what have the CPS children lost these previous years by having a short school day? And what specifically will be gained by having a longer school day? So um, perhaps you've seen that um, we have much ground we have to cover in terms of making sure our kids are post-secondary uh, ready. So we know adding 90 minutes to the school day and do doing nothing else will not change the system. As someone said, that they may show a movie for, for a much longer period of time. So we know it has to be coupled with the right kinds of professional development, the right kinds of support for principals and teachers to understand how to reinvent the school day. So very simply, we've said to a lot of our principals as we do this, Please don't just tack on something else at the end of the day, but to take a look at the school day in its totality and change it. Let me give you some examples. Where you may not have arts every day or music every day, that might change. Where some schools require a double block of literacy or some kids a triple block of literacy or mathematics, it gives you the opportunity to do that. Uh, those of us in the room who may be teachers or former teachers, try and teach in 40 minutes. Uh, have a real robust conversation in 40 minutes. First of all, if it's a 40, 40, 40 or 45 minute period, by the time they come in, you take attendance, they sit down, they settle down, you've lost 12 minutes. So you're trying to have, I don't know, that's physics, try to have a discussion in 28 minutes, it doesn't work. So you learn to squeeze every second out of 45 minutes. But when I taught a class that was an applied physics course that met twice a week for three hours, and there was no end because the kids could stay as long as I wanted to, we had a great time. We talked about the work. Um, so if you have more time, in other words, it allows for the kinds of robust, um, say even a Socratic seminar to actually take place, a real good discussion to take place. Or if you have struggling readers, you can do what they call a workshop, where kids have time to read on their own, time to read, be read to aloud, time to do group and independent work. It gives the teacher tools to get kids to proficiency. And we knew, do know that so many of our kids come to our schools not ready to learn, right? Think about the fact that schools are becoming more and more for some kids. And as a parent, you know, my daughter spent the summer at the zoo and at the art institute. How many of our parents have the capacity or the wherewithal to do that? So they sit in front of a television set for the summer and they come to school and the school is expected to do everything for that child. I don't know about you, but it's hard to do in five hours. To take a child who's coming in, who's not been read to, who's coming to us functionally illiterate, then they gotta be college ready in a few short years. I don't know how you do that in five hours. We need much more time. Look at charter schools, they go beyond what we are trying to push. Um, the KIPP schools, if you read um, the book um, um, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell's book, talks about getting around the cultural legacies that so many kids bring to school. They're coming in with lots of issues to our schools. Um, then we expect to make them ready for Northwestern or Loyola you know, in, in a short amount of time without giving our teachers and principals the tools they need to actually get there. That's what we're fighting for, um, giving our folks the tools that they need to be successful. But we do know it's much more than time. It's about looking at the quality 
of the people who are in our schools, hiring and retaining the best and brightest. Uh, the reason why I push for equity in teacher pay is I want the top tier college graduates in our classrooms. Uh, and to, to, to get that, one, you have to offer a fair salary. Two, you gotta give them agency in their job. It can be based, because today's teacher does not come into our offices and say, hmm, in 40 years, I'm making this much money. They don't do that. Um, maybe, you know, some of us did maybe years ago, but today's generation see their friends who are lawyers and doctors and, and, and managing groups in major companies who are moving up the ladder within their profession. Um, today's teacher doesn't expect to sit in the classroom for 40 years. They want mobility. And if you have children who are teachers, trust me, they'll tell you that. They've said it to me, and I've heard it. Um, so that's what we're fighting for, a way of paying people um, that they expect. By the way, what you hear from me is not rhetoric. It is based on research done by a woman named Susan Moore Johnson out of Harvard. Tons of surveys done of this and the last generation of teachers. And they're very different in terms of expectation than maybe what we expected many, many years ago. Well, JC, we're going to go to the rapid fire round, which means rapid answers, yes. too. Yes. <laughs> Guy's really learning, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Uh, rapid fire. Here we go. David, some of these questions are similar, so don't get upset if I pass over because they're similar. But this is David Heiser, and I don't understand this, so therefore I'm going to ask you. Renaissance Knights Chess, fine. What role does educational games such as chess have in school and extended school days? Is that a legit question? I think it is. Um, okay. Talking about uh, not just clubs. Uh, we're talking about enriching activities like chess. Um, my only concern about our chess program is, is that it tends to be tiered toward kids who are high performing. I don't know about you, I've seen kids who struggle in reading, get in front of a chess board, and they do amazing stuff. Um, so we've got to find a way to bring it across the district. And we've done, by the way, um, it's become not, it was part of our policy that was passed by the board last Wednesday. So we are expanding, and we'll need to bring chess to many more schools across the city. All right. Good question. Uh, <laughs> This is from Tracy Stansel, a parent. You've mentioned that you will give the principals more autonomy. What will that look like? That's a great question. So that, that's the question that we are unpacking right now. Let me just say that autonomy does not mean anarchy, right? Why we call it bounded autonomy. So it's autonomy within a framework. Uh, and we're working with our principals in our central office to determine exactly what that means. And again, as the capacity of the system changes, we'll move the bar differently to allow more freedom. Bottom line, you hire smart people and you get out of their way. Uh, this, uh, Erica, I, have your, I, I can't pronounce your middle name. We'll just say Erica Phillips from the McCormick Foundation. What is the district's plans for, re for connecting early learning to K-12 so that there's more connection uh, between the two educational systems? So I'm assuming early learning, you're talking about uh, early childhood uh, pre-K. Um, right now, as you know, the mayor just launched a task force looking at early childhood education. Um, we've not funded it well, in part, I think, because of the kind of system or funding system we have um, in, in our state. Again, um, not to uh, keep going back to New York, but we had, in my old district, full-day kindergarten across the entire district, universal pre-K that was funded by the state. Um, that's the kind of advocacy we also need to make sure we fund things really, really well. Um, my son is 20 months old. And my wife is already looking for an early childhood program for him at 20 months. Um, that's the kind of system we need. Um, we need more three-year-old programs, more four-year-old programs, but so much of that comes back to funding. Uh, we have parents who are paying tuition in some of our programs. While we have increased, I think about 6,000, Tim, 6,000 seats for this year invested in classrooms for early childhood. We've done, if despite the massive shortfall, we've, we've invested in that, but we know we can do much more. Okay, we're going to have three more questions. Uh, you know, you've been getting a lot of softballs, uh, uh, JC. Here we go. I've been uh, Bonnie Johnson, where are you, Bonnie? Raise your hand. All right. Uh, there are eight college preps in the city. Jones Prep, Walter Payton, Whitney Young, and Northside College rank in the top ten schools in the state. These schools are located on the Northside, West Loop, and downtown. Keene College Prep, Wendell and Brooks College Prep, and Bloom College Prep, Lynn Bloom College Prep, or Bloom, I don't know, all on the south side don't rank in the top 40. Why the disparity? So a very short question, very short answer to the question. It goes back to our work on portfolio. That's exactly what we're talking about. So looking at equity across the system, looking at seat quality across the system. 
that's the study being done right now as we speak. We expect the first blueprint, the data to come out by the end of September, early October for that kind of dialogue to see what we do next. If you read the IFF report very quickly, 25 neighborhoods uh, were under um, uh, represented in those high quality seats back in the late 90s or even the mid 2000s after when, when 10. Um, the fact is that eight neighborhoods, 25 neighborhoods still uh, have a great need for those quality seats. So that's exactly the work we're doing to address the look at this kind of disparity. Sam, bad question number two. Uh, this is from G. Hurston, Ace Tech Charter School, Charter High School, excuse me. Mayor's ambition to ensure every child has access to world class learning. Equitable funding is critical to charter schools and their ability to provide the same or same programs as traditional schools. How will you ensure that charter school students who are public school students have access to world class educational experience? So, as far as I know, all charter school students are public school students. Uh, that's critical. Let's make sure we all understand that. They're not private schools, they're public schools. Um, I've heard this question sort of uh, bent back and forth across the district as to whether or not we have parity in terms of funding for charters versus CPS schools. Studies have been done, the argument continues. So I've asked the folks at New Schools for Chicago to actually sit with us in a small team and let's answer the question once and for all um, to make sure that we are fair and equitable in funding all of our public schools equitably. So we are looking at that. Um, and if there is a need for change, we'll make it happen. And the last question from board member Ed Mazur. And you knew this was coming. Have you changed your automobile registration from New York to Chicago and your driver's license? So I guess someone read the trip today. Um, I have an appointment next week um, <laughs> to, make, to, make, to make it happen. Um, fact, fact is, you know, when you work uh, 14 hours a day and uh, my wife has been quite busy without uh, 20 month old, it's been, I can't let her go take a test with a baby in her arm. So we do have an appointment. Um, and trust me, we want to be, so we want to blend in, so we should, we'll make that happen next week. How about a big round of applause, Robert?